Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we have the pleasure of learning from Jackie Shea. Jackie is a fungal evolutionary biologist and microbial ecologist fascinated with the intimate history and future significance of symbiotic relationships between plant hosts and their microbial communities. Her goal is to use integrative techniques to explore these interactions in the natural world and learn how we can apply these partnerships to promote conservation and resilience through climate change. Jackie received a master's in ecology, evolution, and conservation biology from the Desjardins Lab at San Francisco State University, studying the evolution of the wood-decaying mushrooms Merasmius from Madagascar. She is currently a PhD student in the Sexton and Frank Labs in the Quantitative and Systems Biology Program at the University of California, Merced. This interdisciplinary team has set out to uncover the mystery behind the monkey flower microbiome and discover whether these microbes influence their plant hosts across its range. I'm stoked to learn about her master's and PhD research projects and discover the deep insights that she has gleaned about fungal interactions with plants and fungal and plant resiliency. Jackie, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. What an introduction. <laughs> well, I have to say I pulled it almost all from your website, so you had a very good introduction there. I forgot for what me. I wrote on there, but it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty spot on. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot to talk about. You know, I think focusing just on your two kind of major research projects is enough for multiple podcasts. So We'll do the best we can, but before we dive into it all, I am super, super curious of what the origin story was, you know, how you came to get interested in biology, how you ended up having a passion for fungi. Where did this all start for you or how did it come about? Yeah, it's a great question. I actually mostly grew up in cities, so concrete kingdoms for sure between <laughs> New York and Portland and Los Angeles. Not a lot of interaction with nature. And so it wasn't until I went to a summer camp in Colorado, Estes Park, Colorado in the Rockies, stunning place to go away for the summer, that I really started to get out and hike and camp and horseback ride. And, you know, they had like patches and stuff and you had to kind of like learn about flowers and learn about the trees. And I was just smitten with... <laughs> the plant life and the diversity. And I was just kind of blown away by it. And actually my favorite flower to this day was the very first plant I ever correctly identified, which what? is Castilea, you know, miniata, the little um, paintbrush, beautiful paintbrush flower. I just, I fell in love with it. And every summer I kept coming back wanting more and more and more. And then I'd go back to the city and I was just like, oh, the city, you know, I just want to go back in the nature. And I think what happened was when I went to the Peace Corps after I graduated from my undergrad, I was in Morocco and I spent a lot of time backpacking through the mountains of Morocco, delivering toothbrushes to really, really rural communities that had no access to roads and teaching them how to brush their teeth and teaching oh, them how incredible. to wash their hands. And so like things we really take for granted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like they did not know how to use a toothbrush. And so kind of just showing the kids how to do that. And I started to see all these like plants and mushrooms in particular that I just was like, what is this? I've never seen anything like this before. And I actually started to get a little angry that I didn't know <laughs> what it was. You know, I was like, well, I'm like upset. Like, well, I don't understand what these things are. It just seems like there's so much unknown. And at that time, I wanted to be like a doctor. I wanted to be a gynecologist. I just graduated with a you know, degree in biology. I wanted to go to med school. And it just flipped my whole perspective of biology completely around. And I realized, oh, you know, I could use this biology degree and like not be so angry about the fact that I don't know anything about the natural world. Like I can go and like study this stuff. And I started just like looking up stuff about mushrooms, you know, like reading papers, research papers on mushrooms. And I just started to realize like, wow, there's like a lot we don't really know there's just a whole world of opportunity for learning about mushrooms and fungi. And so I just kind of got hooked and I was so excited to reach out to Dennis Desjardins at San Francisco state, because I think he might have a soft spot for Peace Corps volunteers. <laughs> there's like four other Peace Corps volunteers that were in his lab at some point. 
And uh, yeah, I reached out to him and told him, look, I don't have any experience with this stuff. I have a degree in biology, but I am very interested in learning more about fungi and diversity and mushrooms. And will you take me? And he was like, yeah, come on board. And that I was in the Peace Corps when this was happening. So yeah. I'm just going to like little internet cafes, emailing him, you know, from these little internet cafes, being like, will you please take me? <laughs> <laughs> well, and when you talk about, you know, the vast opportunity to study mushrooms, that really stands out to me with that kind of first big research project, I think, that you had. And this goes back, I, I was telling you right before the show, you know, I saw you speak at the Marin Mycological Society back in 2017. Yeah. And you taught us about marasmias. Mm -hmm. And marasmias are those delicate, beautiful, often little creatures that so many mushroom people have seen a million times when you're out hiking. And just the fact that you've been able to really do some of the most in-depth research, it opened my eyes to think, wow, a mushroom as commonplace as that still didn't really have this kind of in-depth study done, like how much potential is out there? So yes, yeah. it seems endless. It's like, I mean, you don't really know very much at all about kingdom fungi. You know, they are still just a bag of mysteries left to be discovered, which is what makes it so exciting. Absolutely. I mean, especially just in the U.S., there's a huge amount of fungal exactly. diversity to explore, much less, you know, going over to Madagascar. So I guess <laughs> what was the inspiration to go to Madagascar to study Merasmius? So when I first got to, you know, San Francisco and started working with Dennis, I, you know, asked him, you know, what would you like me to study? I have no idea what I'm doing. You can just kind of point me in the direction and I will just, <laughs> I'll just go from there. And he sort of had like a list of projects that he wanted to work on. And one of them was for Sarcodon of California, which Sarcodon are like the tooth fungi. They have these like scaly caps and the teeth. Yeah, yeah, and sure. I even think the name Sarcodon sounds like a dinosaur. So I was like all about it because I was like, ooh, the Sarcodon dinosaur. Totally. But that year, which was 2012, was 2012, 2013, 2014, pretty bad drought times. So there was like not a lot of fungi in general. The diversity, I mean, every mushroom meeting I went to, everyone was like, oh, what a bummer. It's drought. So I would be traveling all over California trying to find these little guys and I just couldn't find them anywhere. And so I was like, Dennis, I think I need to go someplace wet. <laughs> this is, I only have so much time to get my master's. And he loves Merasmius. That's his baby. That's his genus. That's his go-to. And so I was like, I want to be passionate about what you're passionate. Like, why are you so passionate about these guys? And the moment I asked that question, he became like a whole other person and he just, he just like bloomed and flourished and thrived. And was like, Oh, let me tell you why these are the best. And I just got so influenced by his enthusiasm yeah. for Merasmius. And I was chatting with him about, you know, well, where are some places in the world that, you know, need to be explored more? And he was like, well, he was suggesting all these places, but I really wanted to go to Madagascar. And a lab mate of mine, who was actually another Peace Corps volunteer in Bolivia, Brennan Wink Riley, he said to me once, he was like, look, during your master's, this is a really great opportunity for you to do what you want to do and like research what you want to research. And it's going to make it more, it's going to make it a lot better if you're doing something that you're really passionate about. And right. I was like, well okay, then I want to go to this place. I don't think a lot of research has been, there was like a few studies that were done with Merasmius in Madagascar. And so I was like, I'm going to go there. And then I told Dennis, he was like, well, I have no money for you to do this. So you're going to have to figure that out right. on your own. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, driving around California is one thing. Flying to Madagascar to crawl around the rainforest is like a totally different thing. And I was like, that's fine. So I like campaigned for money. I did a Kickstarter. Right. Yeah, I remember that. I was like one of the only people I ever knew that raised money for research through campaigning. I don't and think I've ever heard of that. Yeah. It started <laughs> for scientific research. I made this really funny video and I was just kind of pushing it and explaining to people how wonderful it would be to go and to, and to understand this diversity, especially with these little, you know, sapotrophic fungi, which are wood decomposers, they're recyclers, they you know, play such an important role in the ecosystem, even though they're these tiny little fairy umbrellas, you know, they're just these little things that you would just walk right over if you were walking around the woods. But to me, they 
they were so much more than that. And I just got so excited and I raised enough money to go and to bring a field assistant with me to take pictures, Danny Newman, who's an amazing mushroom photographer. And everything kind of happened from that. That's what spurred the rest of the research, basically. Well, at best you can, I don't think we can quite channel Dennis's energy here, but what were the revelatory insights about Merasmius? I mean, why should we, uh, other than they are beautiful and delicate and they're so cool, I mean, what were the things that just blew you away about Merasmius that he was so excited about? I mean, he just gets like a little kid when he talks about them, but I think this ecological role that they play yeah. is really not emphasized enough in the literature. We don't know enough about its impact on other species and nutrient cycles in the system. And obviously I wasn't studying nutrient cycles, but you know, the more we understand the diversity and start to actually discover these fungi, these species, describe them, get their genetics, get that loaded into a database, the more we're going in the future, you know, this whole science thing of like you're really not thinking about what we can do now but we're sort of thinking about what we can do like in the grand scheme of time between right. all scientists which is like why i love science so much we could answer some questions about how these little tiny mushrooms might be playing these massive roles in essentially providing nutrients for the plant life and insects that are in these sometimes endangered rainforest systems yeah, and where other mushrooms are getting plucked out because, you know, they're either picked up by animals to be eaten or by people or, you know, for deforestation, all these terrible things that are sort of happening in the forest systems. These little guys kind of go a little unnoticed and right. they kind of keep working. They keep working to get that litter down. Cause if you can imagine if there was none of these, you know, if there was no bacteria and there's none of these sort of saprotrophic fungi, eating the plant litter of these rainforests, which produce tons of plant litter. It, just, it would pile up, the forest floor would suffocate, and the entire forest health would be compromised. So they yeah. actually are a key player in the immunity of the forest as a whole. And we have to start by understanding who they are and get their genetics before right. we can understand what they're doing. So it's kind of like this stepwise contribution to science. It's hard to conserve and protect what you don't really have well-defined. And I love that idea that there are these humble little workhorses out there doing a lot of the work that the forest needs in nutrient cycling. Uh, and we talk about reducing leaf litter, you know, any natural process to reduce the amount of detritus in the forest floor. I think anyone in California and Oregon right now is like, yes, please. You know, we need <laughs> more, of, more that. of that. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> totally. So I guess what questions then did your research look at because i know you just said it wasn't nutrient cycling but what questions were you trying to answer or was it just that raw data gathering that you were after yes yeah, so it was really a biodiversity survey and my goal was to produce the most comprehensive monograph of the genus globally so mm -hmm. i not only contributed my you know 44 samples or whatever that i ended up getting good sequence data for but I included like another 230 samples from across the globe, from Thailand, wow. from Brazil, from all these different places to produce a phylogeny, a tree, uh, an evolutionary tree, to show how these creatures have changed over time and in space, because we could really see the relationship between where they are geographically. And at that time that I produced that monograph, that was the most, that was the most comprehensive monograph that there was or, or tree for that genus. And that tree has been used in a number of publications since then to help influence and to help people sort of understand where these taxa kind of pull out. What are they most related to? How is that going to contribute to their descriptions or taxonomy and our understanding of like who they are? It's sort of question about who they are, where do they come from, what are they related to? I mean, that sounds like a massive project, not only to go out in the field in Madagascar and collect 40 some samples, get them sequenced. Just that data gathering alone is a lot of work. But then to have to pull from libraries all over the world and try to make a comprehensive tree I mean, that's, had you ever... Yeah, I was told later it was like a PhD level work that I did for Yeah, I was going to say, like, <laughs> did you have any idea that's what you were getting into when you started? 
you know, on paper, it doesn't look like <laughs> sort of didn't look paper. that bad. <laughs> no, I was like, I'm just gonna go and like find some mushrooms and then describe them. And I was really interested in the genetics at the time. You know, that was yeah. really my the molecular side of it was kind of where my head was. I mean, I love the field work. Don't get me wrong, that was probably the best part. But I also just loved getting a genome. You know, getting these amplicon sequence regions and like being able to like be like, oh, look, I got this DNA. <laughs> how many <laughs> like, how many genes in each one on average were you looking at? So I was only looking at the ITS region, which okay. is this really highly, it's this interesting region of fungal genomes that have these very conserved, one conserved region, and then these two highly variable regions that almost bookend that region. Oh. So when you kind of are looking for it in the genome, you can design these primers that can find that conserved region because it's the same for every single fungus there is. Wow. It's exactly the same. So they can be like, oh, found it. And then yeah. they'll read out from that, from both sides. And then that's where you get your variation in the species. And that's where you can start to delineate, okay, this is the one taxa. This is another taxa, taxon, excuse me. <laughs> and so that's, that's where you start to like look at the differences between them. So that's almost a common thread between all fungi that then any derivations start telling you where it falls. Really interesting. Really interesting. Exactly. I'm starting to learn a little bit more about genetics, you know, and ITS definitely stands out as the one it seems like most people are going off of. Then I know it blew my mind just to understand that now when we sequence one genetic sequence, there's a specific primer for that. And then there's mm -hmm. hundreds, thousands more that we can look at. So many more. So I use two primers for each one going in a different direction. Oh, that okay, was what right. I, yeah. To get your bookends. Exactly. Okay, and then to pull my head out of waters that I don't quite understand, what was the field? <laughs> what was the field work like? Because Madagascar is such a vivid, interesting place. I think most people have this exotic image, even though ninety nine percent of us have never been there. But what was that like? What was the field exploration like? And just it was, Madagascar? yeah, I mean, it was unbelievably incredible. Definitely a lot of hard work. I don't think people really understand how difficult field work is. It is twenty four seven work. I mean, you're never. You barely sleep, you're constantly working, you're out all day collecting, and then you're up all night taking your notes because these little mushrooms would change in their color and their shape and their size so quickly because their name, Marasmius, comes from the word marcescence, which means that you can rejuvenate it with water, but it also decays really quickly. So I had to go back, I would uh, actually use moss to like I would dampen moss and keep them in my little tackle box, a oh, fishing tackle genius. box. So I had all these little tackle box yeah. moss squares. <laughs> yes. And like they, each like one, it was like a little bed of moss and keeping it wet all day until I could get back into my little hut or wherever I was and then take all the notes on them because I couldn't take notes when I was looking for them out in the forest. Right. And that, then I would stay up all night doing that and I would do it again the next day and again the next day. So it was like three days like that and then like a day off and then like three days like that. So it was so intense, but it was really beautiful. I got to work with the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco has a biodiversity research station out in Antenna Nerevo, which is the capital of Madagascar. So I collaborated with them for lodging and they had a mycologist that they worked with at a local wow. herbarium that they could connect me with. And so I like the mushrooms was making all these sort of interactions with people <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of really building a strong team. They were able to suggest some places where the mushrooms might be. And, you know, we went to Ramanathana national park sort of on the South western southeastern side excuse me of the country we didn't get, do anything on the west because the west is like where the baobabs are it's more like desert savanna okay ecosystem whereas the rainforests are more on the right side the, the eastern side of the of the island and then in the middle of madagascar is this high elevation plateau so you can kind of imagine these high elevation grasslands and then rainforest on the right desert on the left huh and we had one site in the high elevation plateau because there was this forest island. I guess in the past, before it was a grassland, it was a high elevation cloud forest. And the forest has since deteriorated. And now there's only, there's these like islands of forests. And so we actually went into one of those islands 
I wish I could have spent another day there because there was an incredibly interesting diversity that came from that particular place. And then we went to a few of the forests on the eastern coasts, and it was really beautiful. And we drove around in this car, and we would get to our locations, and I had like four people with me. So our main guide, Rocky, who was so great, my photographer friend, Danny, and then like usually one or two other people, someone who knew the local area. Sure. And then like a friend of theirs. Sometimes it was the chief of the community that lived near there, or sometimes it was a local farmer or somebody who knew their way around the forest because these forests were thick and they were chopping down trees and stuff. And I think in the beginning, they thought we were going to be moving pretty quickly, but they quickly would look back and realize like I was crawling around, <laughs> like picking up leaves here and there, like looking for these guys. And they're like, oh, we well, need to move like a lot slower. And I was like, yeah, we need to move a lot slower. <laughs> like, <laughs> finding mushrooms is not this like hiking through the woods kind of thing, especially right. for these guys. It's really like slow going and like crawling for real. And we would basically, I started to show them what the mushroom looked like. I found one. I was like, okay, if you could like find stuff like this. And then I would just sit there and take, you know, start packing my mushrooms up and kind of find them around me and kind of crawl around and go like nowhere. And they would all sort of spread out and (laughs) try to find mushrooms that looked like what I was trying to go for. So it was kind of this really great dynamic where I'm just kind of sitting there crawling around and they're all running around the forest like coming back to me have oh, this one this one this one I was like yes yes no yes <laughs> that's invaluable is to have your team out there gathering because yeah crawling around you're not going to make it super far no yeah Maybe. we ended up getting like over 80 something um, wow the reason why we only ended up with 44 samples was because through the molecular process you know there was just some just kind of fell off the radar in terms of their quality of data and, and things like that and did you find similar population or similar species of marasmus across eastern forests and this cloud forest? So they had kind of moved their way around Madagascar or did they speciate at all? Yes, there were definitely some species of marasmus that were very common, I would say. They would kind of almost in every location we would find them. And then there were others that were really specific to where we were looking at. I think the high elevation forest was like one that was that had a lot of really unique species and then we also were exploring this forest outside of Andasi Bay which is like on the eastern coast and it was like a sand forest like the soil was sand which I thought was so interesting and like these mushrooms don't grow from the soil so you know they grow from leaf litter directly it was still sort of weird to like be looking for mushrooms in the sand you know I was like oh this is strange that's kind of crazy. And yeah. there were some unique ones there as well. My favorite one that I found, though, was by accident. <laughs> because I was just walking around and I like ran into what I thought was a very intense cobweb. And I'm like pulling this cobweb off my face and I'm like looking at it. And then like I'm looking at it more closely and I see these little mushrooms growing out of it. And I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? And... I found out later <laughs> this is an aerial rhizomorphic marasmius, which was what? like, which just blew my mind. That was mycelium then, not a wind. Yes, it was like these, well, it wasn't mycelium. They actually, it's rhizomorphs. It's like these, it was like a little hardier than mycelium, like sure. a little thicker. And basically what they would do is they create these networks of rhizomorphs in the trees to catch the falling leaves to beat the competition on the forest floor. They like create these networks, they catch the leaves and then they can, then their mycelium will go into the leaves and start to digest it and eat it and do its thing. And then it doesn't have to deal with the competition. It doesn't have to deal with all the stuff on the ground being like, oh, me first, me first. Because they're very competitive, these little saboteurs. Well, it's amazing (laughs) to see how competitive mushrooms do get in that ecological food chain. They keep trying to adapt to go further and further, even to the point where I know uh, from the work of Lynn Body that, you know, there are saprotrophic mushrooms already present in most wood and leaves just waiting. Waiting. So once that condition changes, suddenly they can emerge. Really interesting stuff. And I guess, were there any other mind-blowing insights, anything else you didn't expect uh, from the fieldwork part or maybe the genetics or just, you know, something during that? I mean, I'm sure there was a lot of like revelatory insight, but just something that even now kind of sticks with you that you discovered 
during that whole field work and genetics process. Yeah. Well, I was very proud to discover five new species. Of wow. Algae. Yeah. And like, I got to name them and that was like a big sort of, I couldn't believe I could do that. You know, that was like a, I, I wasn't, expe- I was hoping that that would happen, but I wasn't sure. expecting it to happen, especially to that extent, like five of them. And one of them, we named it, Marasmia Socola, and in Malagasy, Socola meant chocolate, and it was because it was like this like chocolate brown mushroom. So we kind of oh. wanted to like honor the language a little bit and name it yeah. after chocolate because there's a similar one from a different country, not the same species, but that's also named after the local language. And so we we're like, oh, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna name it after the local language. That'd be great. Yeah. Another one. We named it after a tree because it made these really interesting, there's a lot of microscope work describing mushrooms, which was another part of the project I actually really loved. I spent like four months under the microscope and I started to really like become the microscope. <laughs> <laughs> Extensions I, of your eyes. Totally. They were like becoming me and I would like do these drawings and I just would really get into it. And it would make these hypo growths that looked like Christmas trees, like it looked like pine trees and that perfect wow. little pine tree shape. And so we named it after pine trees, like uh, Marasmius dentra, dentrifolia or something like that. I can't believe I can't remember it. <laughs> well, that's so cool. I mean, you get to live the dream. So many people I ask if they've done field mycology, like, have you gotten to name any mushrooms? Have you gotten to discover? So that's kind of the allure because so many of us know like we were talking about, about that vast unexplored realm of fungi. And it's just that dream of finding one and being able to name a new one. So really cool. You got to do that. How much do we have left to learn about Merasmia? So someone who's probably one of the most familiar in the world. I mean, how much is there left to know about Merasmia? It's endless. I mean, it's endless. (laughs) I was just out there for a month collecting as much as I could. Yeah. And I only got to like five sites. And so I just, you know, and I was only... I was only there when I was there. So, I mean, you could just imagine like any other time and space, you could find a whole other slew of diversity. And that's just for that one genus. So it just, it feels like it's endless. It's just an endless, endless adventure. I welcome anyone to, to get into taxonomy and systematics and discovering new species because it's important for us to understand what's out there in order for us to know what it's doing and, you know, how we can help it or how it's helping us and understand our relationship in the larger picture of the natural world. And what it's cool to me that after speaking with different field mycologists is it kind of offers this level of hope and like purpose that as humanity, we still have so much more to map out by the biodiversity of this place in which we live, that it's infinite. You know, we're going to need thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of mycologists, but also botanists. And there's so much left to be discovered. And I think your work is an amazing, amazing illustration of that. Yeah, it was a great, I was very happy with the contribution that I was able to make. And, you know, the only fear that you know, I would have after such an amazing research project like that in a place as vivid as Madagascar is like, how do you top that? Uh, so I know right now you're doing PhD work with the monkey flower biome, and we're not going to compare and contrast. I'm sure it's amazing. But what is that work? And, you know, what are you exploring in the monkey flower biome? What are monkey flowers? I mean, give us the download on this work. Yeah. So one takeaway I had for my master's was like, this is really great, but this was just one genus, you know, right. like I want to know more about more genera and like relationship. I started to get really into this concept of interactions and symbiosis. And I think I got that bug with Merasmius where it's having this saprotrophic interaction with you know the system and the plants. And I was just like, well, what other kinds of relationships are out there? And can we look at it on more of a big data level? started yeah. to get more into bioinformatics and coding and wanting to understand how can we sort of sample an, like entire communities of fungi and then start to really paint a picture about what they're all doing there. And I was kind of, at the end of my master's, I was like, well, do I go down this like mycorrhizae thing with symbiosis or do I go down this endophyte thing? 
and I'll explain what endophytes are in just a second, but I went to this one conference. I think it was a Mycological Society of America conference, and I must have gone to every endophyte and mycorrhizae talk I could possibly go to to try to get inspiration. Help me choose. Yeah, help me decide my future. <laughs> and I just decided at the end of that conference, like endophytes is where it's at. <laughs> and the reason why I felt that way, so, so endophytes are fungi and bacteria, microbes in general, that... Yeah live their entire life inside the tissue of plants right they are not in the soil they could maybe have come from the soil at some point maybe they came from the air maybe they came from a pollinator that deposited some bacteria or fungus in the nectar that then entered into the body of the plant and then over time developed into an endophyte but essentially they live their entire life inside the plant and so they are considered the part of the microbiome of plant just like the microbes in our gut they're like the microbiome of the plant and there's different communities in the flower versus the stem versus the root versus the leaves you know they got to be doing something in there right right that's what (laughs) i was going to ask are they are they helping harming neutral or just a function we don't know maybe yeah exactly so a lot of them are commensal, which means they just sort of sit there and they don't really do, they just live there. It's just a nice place to live if you think about it. It's like very sheltered, lots yeah, of moisture. It's a great real estate <laughs> compared, really to, great compared real to, estate. to the dirt and how you know, competitive the dirt is. <laughs> so competitive, exactly. <laughs> I, I know. I feel it. I feel the, the like wanting to not be competitive. So they have a nice cushy life in there. But there are some that are which is this, this interests me a lot. There are some that are pathogenic, but then switch and decide, oh, I'm going to be a commensal or I'm going to be mutualistic now. So oh. there are these like changes in the type of symbiotic interaction that happen all the time. So it's really a combination of different ones. And what I became really interested in is can I sort of pinpoint particular fungi or communities of fungi how do these communities change what shapes these communities and what does that mean when the community changes like when there are some fungi there versus others how does that influence the plant how is that influenced by the environment it's in and so i started to really ask these kind of big ecological questions about these relationships and the environment and climate change is this big trigger. Yeah. And so I was like, well, how can I do my part? You know, how can I do my part to, in my little world, in my little time as a a scientist, do something for climate change. And I decided that the way that I was going to approach the climate change issue was I was going to try to understand how these interactions might be playing a role in ameliorating or, or reducing or mediating the stress associated with climate change and plant populations. Right. That took me to monkey flowers because I wanted to study the natural world. I wasn't interested in agriculture, not saying anything bad against agricultural studies. You know, it's obviously important, but I want to understand what's happening in the environment because that's where climate change is going to be hitting native plants. It's going to be changing ecosystem dynamics and biodiversity structures. And this is kind of all where my interest lies. Yeah. Monkey flowers are these incredibly diverse little super cute charismatic plants, by the way. (laughs) They have these faces, like these monkey faces. Oh, hence the name monkey flowers. Yeah, they are so cute. They have these little monkey faces, super diverse. And they also have a tendency to specialize to particular habitats. And so I was interested in looking at drought stress habitats. And there are monkey flowers that grow in these drought stress habitats that some have been shown to be adapted to the drought stress. And I was wanting to know what is going on in the endophyte community in these plants. What is happening? Are they doing anything to help the plants deal with that stress? You know, because it's not like the plants act in by itself. Yeah. And it's like that causal relationship is like, are there endophytic communities that are helping the plant deal with the stress? Is the stress dictating what that community looks like, even if they're just commensal? Exactly. So my big research question is, how does climate change shape these fungal communities? And what is that? How is that interaction sort of playing out in the plant? Like where... Who's popping up, basically? I'm trying to understand, like, which fungi are sort of coming to the light 
when stress is happening. And in my mind, that means that when those fungi sort of come into play, when stress is happening, they're going to have some sort of role in dealing with that stressor or having a relationship with the plant in stress. Yeah. And again, I'm not looking at function. This function would be like a whole other dissertation. Yeah. I'm looking at diversity and abundance and trying to understand these communities of fungi. So I've looked at a few things. I've looked at the plants under stress that I've controlled in a lab environment. And that research has been completed. So it's, I'm happy to share what I found there. What I found was that when we looked at communities in the roots of the plants versus the shoot of the plants and these two being either stressed or not stressed with drought. So like having water or not having water in the, in the control. Yeah. And what we found was that the drought very much plays a role in the community structure and particular fungi, which I was really excited to see pop out in the drought treatments. And these little flowers I study, I study the cutleaf monkey flower, um, Merasmus, Mimulus licinatus. It kind of sounds like Merasmus though. Definitely. And these little guys grow on these like mossy patches on granite rock outcrops in the Sierra Nevada of California. So if you're ever driving in the Sierra Nevada and you see these big granite like pieces coming out yeah. of the earth, do you, yeah. do you know what I mean? That's where they are. They're always I feel like, like I've seen these then. Okay. <laughs> You'll see these like patches of moss sort of on the granite and they're just growing. They don't grow in soil. Again, they don't grow in the soil. They grow in the moss and they're very small. I'm very drawn to the small things. I like the tiny world. And what we found was that some species of fungi that were popping out are known to be these arid adapted rock dwelling fungi that, that like sense. live on the rocks. And yeah. are associating with the plants and are playing a larger role in terms of its community composition when the plant is stressed. So they're kind of coming out more, which might mean that they be, are having some sort of functional relationship with the plant that's in stress. So they're drought. realizing maybe that the plant's in stress somehow, whether that's chemical signaling or something going on there, able to come in and try to help like, hey, we're adapted to this environment. Let us imbue you with a little bit of that resiliency. And in the lab, do you think that the experiments you did in the lab, and you can give us as much detail, you know, as you can or as you want to about what you did, do you think that is pretty analogous to what happens in the natural world? Only because I know sometimes things in the natural world get really overcomplicated really fast, whereas in the lab, you're kind of isolating. So I guess maybe a little bit about what you did in the lab and how yeah, well you think that we translates. Yeah, we did the best we could to kind of mimic the natural world, but of course it's not. And my current study is looking at the entire range of the flower across its natural landscape. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, so I'm answering some big questions about how these communities are shifting across habitat, climate, and space. But with the one in the lab, what we did was we collected a bunch of the moss in the soil that the plants grow out of, and they leave their seed in the seed bank of the soil. Okay. And we potted that soil in the lab and then just let the seeds grow from the soil we collected. We didn't put any seeds into it because we have all these seeds in the lab, but we, we decided to just grow the natural seed. And then we mimicked the conditions in a growth chamber of the environment. So the same light conditions that they would be experiencing, the same temperature conditions. And then the water, which would obviously be very different. We just highly sterilized this water using Millie 4 water. The idea is there's no sort of added microbial. And so from that, there was some definite differences. Well, what was interesting was the, the shoot communities really didn't change that much. Not a lot was happening in the shoot of the plant. And I would imagine that in the natural world, that wouldn't be the case so much because I think that there would be more interaction with insects and with the air and you know things depositing on the tissue of the plant itself. Right. But where we really saw the difference in the lab was in the root communities, which is where plants would be recruiting fungi to come in through their root system and help them in times of stress. We know sure. that plants recruit microbes through their roots. We know that they can mimic signaling to get certain microbes on board. And we know that they are specific about which microbes they're picking. 
to come in and, and be a part of their microbiome. What we don't know is what those microbes are doing once they're in the microbiome. <laughs> right, right. That function, that critical function element. So hard to answer that question. Again, I'm sort of in this like place where, well, I want to understand who's there and who else is around when they're there as well to try to help future scientists to get at that function question. Exactly. You're building that framework for future scientists. I may be jumping way, way, way far ahead, but do you see any potential applied uses of understanding these fungal communities as it pertains to drought-stressed areas? I mean, do you think the findings with monkey flowers are something that then could be applicable maybe to other plants in similar situations? I definitely think so, especially when we're thinking about conservation or restoration for native landscapes or habitats. There's also applications into agriculture as well, although there's like a whole other layer of study happening with agricultural communities. But by understanding maybe how these communities are shifting in response to stress, we can get a better sense of which fungi are key players in these communities during stressful times. And that might be important for understanding how we can preserve those communities for the habitats that we know are going to be experiencing more drought or experiencing more stress as climate change progresses. And that's where we can see that application happen, is understanding the necessity of these fungal communities and thinking about ways that we can preserve them. Well, a neophyte question here. Are the fungal communities you find in endophytes, are those fungi, endophytic fungi, totally unique? Like you will only find those within a plant? Or would we recognize some of these fungi living in the soil? Or I guess what I'm asking is, is this endophytic capacity just like a trait that can be developed by fungi we might find elsewhere? Or are the endophytic fungi you find strictly endophytic in these populations, that is the only place you find them is in plants. We are finding an incredible diversity of fungi in these endophytic communities. Some of them are pseudomycetes, so they're club-forming, mushroom-forming fungi that are just in their more high-flow cellular form inside the plant. They're not going to be forming mushrooms inside the plant, obviously, but their cellular presence is still there. Sometimes we find soil fungi, Sometimes we find, like I said, these like almost rock inhabiting fungi that have made their way inside of the plant. I have even found fungi that are associated with nematodes, like a nematode associated fungi I have found. So nematodes are naturally occurring in the soil. So it might make sense that this fungus was just around this nematode and then somehow got taken up by the plant. So we're actually finding there are, and then a lot of unidentified stuff, which is where I get really excited. (laughs) So I'm imagining that a lot of the unidentified stuff would be these more specialized or rare or unique fungi that might be specifically associated with this plant or with this community or with this particular habitat. Whereas the ones that we are seeing that pop out are more well-known fungi from different systems and might have been identified from their mushrooms and not just as this sort of environmental sample that I'm collecting. That's what's so interesting is sometimes I wonder if, you know, mycorrhizal capacities, endophytic capacities, these are all capabilities of fungi and just different species have developed them more strongly than others or, you know, but they can, but fungi can reach into some of these different capabilities when we think Maybe they can't, you know, classic is like mycorrhizal fungi having saprobic capability, but it sounds like, you know, there are different fungi that we don't associate. We don't immediately think of, you know, oh, it's an endophyte, but they have endophytic capability. That's really interesting. You're also bringing up something I think of as, I, I think one of my guests called it dark endophytes, like a dark matter. Yes, that's most of them. Most yeah. of it is dark endophytes, the stuff we just don't know. And that's the stuff I'm hoping to clear up a little bit. There's just so much to learn endophytes as i understand are relatively recent i mean they were cultured out maybe in like the 60s or 70s isn't that when it started yeah and then ever since all this you know metagenomic technology has been coming out in the last 10 20 years then we've really been able to sink our teeth into these community structures because otherwise we're only able to identify what we can culture right and most of them are not culturable 
that's just how it is with fungi a lot of the times so you really just can't culture this stuff and so we only can really find it through these more environmental genomic um, methods it's fascinating so i think endophytes are one of the most interesting frontiers of mycology so i can definitely see why you chose to look into them for you <laughs> i mean for you if there's like one or two what are the big burning questions when it comes to endophytes i mean maybe you answered them but what are like in your mind the big next frontiers of really getting into the world of endophytes definitely this function thing like how does the structure of the community of endophytes affect the function of these microbes like what types of genes are being activated when these communities change so the climate is changing the communities and that's kind of what i'm studying is that piece but like the next piece would be how does that shift in the communities from the climate change affect the way that the genes are expressing themselves and what does that mean for the plant because right. that's where a lot of our interest is going to come in especially when we're thinking about restoration conservation and agriculture is how is this affecting the plant so you probably need to take it from areas not affected by climate change areas affected by climate change compare and contrast yeah and get at that metagenomic aspect as well looking at the genes what a dive that is <laughs> Oh my gosh. Like I said, getting into the world of genes, I'm just kind of peeking into that world. And, you know, when you hear it from the perspective of, you know, someone who's taking gene sequences, sending it to a lab, getting the information, what you don't quite realize is that's kind of where the real difficult translation part happens. Is you get back that genomic data and it doesn't say at the top, like, this is the species. No, you get a bunch of data and now you have to run it through gem bank or do the blast system and figure out where this lies phenologically, you know, and start seeing totally. what clade it might be in. There's so much nuance. I mean, that's why it's a whole discipline unto itself. Yeah. There's the bioinformatics, there's the phylogenetic aspect, and then there's just even considering all the limitations of the molecular process, the limitations of the primers, the limitations of the extraction method you use. The limitations of the sterilization technique you use to get rid of all the microbes on the outside of the plant. There's all these things I have to consider. So we're not even really getting the whole picture. We're so limited in our understanding of what we can and cannot do. And that's just kind of part of science is like, as we continue to develop methods and techniques and get better, we're understanding these pieces more holistically, but yeah. little by little, we are making progress. You have to really get comfortable with the mystery or with not knowing. Definitely. <laughs> Sounds like facing this vast unknown. It's like being an astronaut, but inside of a plant. <laughs> <laughs> inside of a very cute plant. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you for taking us on a journey through some of this research. because Absolutely. You know, it's really informative and you start to get this idea of the scope of the work left to be done. So I hope everyone listening realizes you need to drop everything and get into the field of mycology so we can figure out these questions. Oh my gosh, we need so many more mycologists and taxonomists and systematists. Yeah, is it something that you see on the rise though? Obviously kind of, and I'm one symptom of it, there's like this big explosion of citizen interest and amateur interest. Is it something that you see on the rise too in, in the actual like academic community? Definitely with mycology, yes. Yeah. I'm definitely seeing a rise in people interested in fungus, kingdom fungi and as well as big data i think people are realizing the benefits of learning how to code mm. and understanding complex bioinformatics systems which have so much skills uh so much transferable skills you know once you learn how to code one way you can learn how to code different ways and like understanding these languages of coding and i think that's on the rise so i yeah. think the combination of the mycology and the bioinformatics is really going to give us some future systematists so I mean, this gets into some of your work. I believe at Merced, you do teach classes and work with students and try to inoculate more people to get into this. So oh, totally. I guess tell us a little bit about the classes you teach and, you know, where can people find your academic work and what classes do you teach? Yeah, I um, was teaching microbiology, which I loved teaching that class. And I have also taught flora of California. So I've definitely gone down the botany train, pretty hardcore like something about learning about mushrooms, you kind of also learn about plants at the same time, or Definitely. maybe that's just me. I don't know. And then I love teaching bio one. So when I first started at Merced, I was teaching introductory biology. And that's where, 
you know, we'd spend one tiny little day talking about fungus, but oh man, do I get everyone really stoked on fungus on that day? <laughs> they all know, like I'm the fungus lady. Right. And uh, it's pretty exciting stuff. But I've sort of switched gears with my career a little bit in an exciting way. I've taken a job at UC Merced as the associate director for the Center for Engaged Teaching and Learning. So wow. I now teach teachers how to teach. You're teaching people how to teach. Yeah. And I important skill. I attribute it to the fungus because because mushrooms taught me so much. And I feel like I I feel like this transition between mycology and pedagogy, the learning of strategies of how to teach, yeah. is not a very far leap for me. Oh, wow. But I am hoping to eventually I'll be at Merced for a bit and what I'm hoping when I, I finish my PhD I'm hoping to maybe be able to teach some future classes at UC Merced particularly I would really love to teach a Mushrooms of California class and use Dennis's book and get people into the field and then I want to study field work and its impact on learning that's like my new frontier is trying as I want to understand how getting students out into the natural world, getting them thinking about these kinds of problems and getting them to think about these types of interactions. How is that impacting how they're learning these like big ecological issues? Yeah. How does that impact their, how their brain operates, how they're able to learn? Maybe that because <laughs> I think from a forager perspective, we all know that, you know, when you go out, Honey for mushroom, like the best way for so many people to learn is to get out in the forest and just start totally. looking. Just and look. that's yeah. that's the best way to learn. So you're actually going to try to dive deep and like codify that, like yes, yes or no. I guess that field work does open up all these different pathways for learning. Really cool. Yeah, and I'd love to start teaching bio one again because. Introductory biology, you got these freshmen, they're like fresh meat, they like have no idea what college is like let yet, and they don't know how to study, and they're like excited but nervous, and they just have no idea what's in front of them. And I just love that group because they are so influential, or they're easily influenced, I guess. Yes. And I just want to share how amazing biology is because there is still to this day this big drop off in how many people are in STEM and then how many people continue with STEM after they graduate. And so, you know, why is that happening? And can we get them inspired and staying on board earlier? So I'm interested in teaching classes in the future again. I'm taking a break from teaching right now to finish my dissertation, mm -hmm. but looking forward to how this new career I have in teaching can be applied to biology and hopefully teaching a mycology class in the future would be my ultimate dream. That would that would mean I would made it. I have, would have made it. <laughs> Once I get to the point where I'm teaching a mycology class in the fall and a biology class in the spring, and I'm also teaching teachers how to teach, that's like dreams have come true for me. Maximal <laughs> impact in the biosphere. Yeah, maximal Jackie impact. Could, yeah. Jackie could have one as like a bio one kind of inside joke my dad actually taught bio one 101 for like 40 years and his big thing was you have to teach people not everyone gets to go to med school but there's plenty of other things to do and that most of them are there for med school and that yeah. that's what i i was in the same boat so like right. i completely identify with that experience and want to introduce people to so much more that's out there and all of these areas of science and research that are needed, even these obscure things, but that if you could just get passionate about it, it can completely change your life. Well, and it's like, we don't know what we're going to learn. You know, I, a lot of times I'll ask, like, what are the research questions you're looking at? And again and again, what comes back is, well, we need to get the lay of the land before we start asking even, you know, the most intelligent questions that we could. We need to know what's out there to know what questions to ask. Exactly. So, is a really, really fundamental stage we're at. And gosh, I'm happy that you're there doing it. I hope there are more passionate and inspired people. I hope more people listening to this, <laughs> passionate and inspired and try to go down this path. That's really cool. And then where can people find you? Where can people find out more about your work, you know, about your classes, all that stuff? I mean, you can find me anywhere through UC Merced, but I guess I really need to update my website if I'm going to be talking about it here. But I, I do have a website, which is JackieShea.com. I try to update that as regularly as possible. Or you can just reach me at jshay 
at ucmerced.edu. That's probably the best way to get in touch with me. So yeah, I'll be at Merced for a while. So if you're ever going to the Yosemite or the Sierras when it's not on fire, you should definitely let me know. Especially well, yeah. if you're going mushroom hunting, I would love to join. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, or people could go to a mycological event in that area. And I'm sure that you'd pop up because I've now seen you at, you know, MSSF events and Sonoma County events. And not only are you kind of on this academic side in the field, you're very much engaged with the foraging community and the citizen science community too. Absolutely. And I recently had some undergraduates approach me about starting a mycological society of Merced. Mm. So I might be getting involved in that as well. Somehow I am not surprised at all <laughs> that that's going on. Well, thank you again for walking through all your research. I guess what I'll do is wrap up with some thoughts that I ask all my guests because I always get fascinating answers that expand my own knowledge. And we'll start with one that's sometimes the most difficult. What is a mushroom or fungi that you love and why? So I'm like obsessed with cordyceps. They are so cool and charismatic and weird. And I just think it's fascinating that every insect has a special cordyceps that comes from them. And I found some really cool ones in Madagascar that I think I posted on my blog some pictures of them. Shea Shrooms is like my blog name. And Shea Shrooms. I, Shea Shrooms. <laughs> I was told it's not professional, but I like it. I have my whole story of Madagascar on there with some pictures, and I think I might have posted some pictures of them as well. Oh, but they were so cool. There was this one coming out of this like stick bug that like with these orange spiked it looked like something out of like a mario game like it was like this orange spiked cap but the spikes yeah. looked so cartoony and fake it was like i can't believe this is real here's a burning question i've always had about cordyceps do you know if there are any that grow in california oh absolutely i think i've okay. seen some here they're everywhere they're like globally distributed as long as they're uh, like yeah they're just they're it's weird to find them when i was in madagascar we would only actually find them in open areas because the way that they disperse their spores is by like they, they go onto the insect and then the insect, well, the ones we found yeah. would crawl out onto like a trail or like an open area. And then the spores would disperse that way so that they had room to move around. Sure. And then other insects would climb up the trees and then disperse down. So it was kind of interesting to see them like that. They would just be right on the side of the road though. So it's very weird ubiquitous in the insect microbiome out there you can find them anywhere oh, yeah. really cool who doesn't love cordyceps i love that answer i know and all their medicinal properties i mean come on if i could do it all over again cordyceps <laughs> <laughs> there's still time there's, there's still, still time. time you're right <laughs> that can be the next that can be the next the next massive frontier project for you oh my gosh um, i've just said it now it's gonna happen <laughs> set intention with the universe you're gonna have to do it uh, and then this is a massive question, but what has a relationship with fungi given to you and brought to your life in terms of perspective, maybe even, you know, spiritual understandings? What has a relationship with fungi given to you? This one's really clear for me. They have given me a whole new appreciation for interactions and relationships uh, on so many levels, on so many levels that they have made me realize the significance of interactions and the quality of interactions and like how different species interact with each other. I feel like they completely taught me what the meaning of symbiosis really is. And it's a really wonderful thing. And I think people, I think humans need to embrace symbiosis more. We need to understand that we are not these like holy beings on the planet. We're part of these ecosystems that have these incredibly complex interactions with organisms everywhere. The organisms living inside of our body, you know, the spiders in the corners of the room that we're sitting in. <laughs> like, it's so complex, the plants and the, I mean, everything. And I just have thought about those interactions so much more and on such a deeper level since the mushrooms taught me that. I think about it all the time now. I can't look at, I look at the world totally differently, especially since entering the endophytic world. I see microbes like everywhere. Like I just <laughs> see them, every, which is, a, it sounds kind of disgusting and maybe complex, but 
it's totally how I see the world now. It's just like covered in little microbes. <laughs> well, it's that kind of curse of the scientists, especially with all the new technology and equipment that we have to see down in the microscopic universe, is you can't ever see anything in isolation again, you know, any no. life form. I'm sure nothing is alone. No one should ever feel alone. Yeah. Just because there's not another person with you, there are like so many living creatures inside you and with you at all times. There are more living creatures inside of you than there are cells of you. Yeah, so you exactly. are a colony. Everyone is a colony unto themselves. And I think fungi are just that perfect model organism. They're so and open to relationships. They're so open to these interactions. That's how, yeah. that's what it taught me. It was like, I need to be more open to interactions and relationships because look at the fungi. Look at how they're just like embracing these interactions left and right. We can just be better humans actually by studying and understanding fungal relationships. Yeah. And mushrooms are people anyway. <laughs> mushrooms are people too. That bumper sticker on my luggage when I travel, people look at me really funny. There we go. All right. This lady is either really cool or really weird, probably both. Um, <laughs> and then finally, what is the lasting impact that you hope to make with your work? And we've kind of nibbled around the edges of that, but what is the lasting impact you hope to make with your research work, your teaching work, all of it? Yeah, I really just hope to, I sort of want to thread this message in my work. And I really hope that this comes across that these these associations, these interactions that I've learned from fungi, from mushrooms, they are so valuable in so many different capacities of our lives. And we have not tapped into the value and the capacity that these interactions can have to better our lives, to better who we are, to better how we interact with the environment, to kind of even translated that to the teaching world, like the interactions between the student and the teacher and how that's developed over the years and how that's changed, where it used to just be this one-sided thing of like lecturing at someone and the other person's just listening. But now it's so much different than that. And students are really benefiting from teachers developing relationships with their students and having more engaging interactions with their students and letting their students interact with each other. So it's almost this like message of, increasing the significance and importance and value of interactions between people, between species, between kingdoms, and honoring these interactions, respecting them, and learning more about what they can what they can do for us and how they can help us be better and help us be better about being stewards of our planet. That's how I've always imagined people, that we're really stewards of the earth. Absolutely. People are always asking, you know, that big question, what's the meaning of life? And I think you just put it really eloquently. We're here to understand to be stewards of this place. It's, it seems pretty apparent to me. And if we can embrace increased interactions like fungi too, and maybe leave our kind of human centric or anthropocentric power gradients at the door. Yeah. You know, that would make. Oh, the change we would see. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> well, I think if you can have that impact and you know, spread that in our society, that would be like the best possible thing. So that's, that's fantastic. Well, Jackie, I am excited to know that you're out there teaching other people and teaching people how to teach because you're incredibly engaging, very informative, you break things down to where even someone like me can understand it. So thank you for coming on a Mushroom Hour and sharing with us your work and yourself. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Oh, it's been so much fun. Thank you so much for having me. I love the conversation.